Thank you. Well, I get the honor this morning of introducing someone very special. And uh, for you visitors that are here, um, we recently uh, unanimously uh, voted in a student pastor. And we were united as a church and believing strong about this decision. And uh, Brother Chris and uh, Lindsey Hunter and their family, Gabriel, right, are, are joining us. And uh, Chris is our, our new full-time student pastor. And so I want to ask the church to uh, commit with me to start today uh, to just pray for that ministry. Uh, we already have a uh, vibrant youth group that's doing well and growing. But we're ready to take that ministry to the next level and uh, reach this community for Christ, particularly the youth. And I'm so excited about Chris being here and Lindsay and the work that they're going to do. Uh, none of us knew, of course, that Pastor was going to be leaving as quickly as he was today. I, th I think there was some time leading up to this. But uh, I'm not even sure that you start work tomorrow, Chris, but preaching today. And boy, he, Pastor didn't waste any time on this one, getting him up here in front of the pulpit and uh, let you guys hear from him. But I'm so excited that he's here today. And I would ask that you just commit to pray uh, for Chris and his ministry. And we're so excited. Uh, that you're here, and uh, just looking forward to hearing from you this morning. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. If I don't officially start until tomorrow, I think I'm entitled to a love offering today. Is that how that goes as a guest speaker? Maybe not. Um, before I start, I want to let you know I spoke with uh, Pastor Russ last evening, and he had so many good things to say about you. Uh, he was bragging on a group of people, I thought about 16 people, that went to the local Head Start building and helped to paint the first floor. And I tell you, he was so encouraged by that. And I certainly am as well. And I'm so excited to be a part of a church who is already reaching out to the community. And if Branson doesn't know it already, they are soon and quickly learning that Skyline Baptist Church is a church that cares for families. And for those who participated, you know who you are. I say God bless you, and may he richly uh, continue to work in your lives. I also want to put a plug in for our youth activity that's this evening. For those who will be in my Sunday school class, uh, grades 7 through 12, I encourage you to come back tonight. If you've never been to a youth activity here before, neither have I. So come on, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. We'll see how everything goes on. Um, I'm just going to have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, I pray that you'll take this time. I pray that you'd anoint it. I pray that you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit. May your words be spoken and not mine, and may you receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. During the September 11th tragedy, I was student pastor. My wife and I were working with the youth in Fort Worth, Texas. It was really eerie because after that, they shut down the airline industry. And with major airports near there, there were planes continually every probably two minutes in the sky. And for it to be dead silent, it was really eerie. The time after the September 11th tragedy was a very stressful time in America for everyone. Doctors even say that they had more instances of ear infections in the weeks after that tragedy than they had at any other time because of the stress in people's lives had brought about something physical like that. Just a couple days after the September 11th tragedy, I think it was even a Saturday night, it was before the next uh, Sunday service, I believe that September 11th was a Tuesday, that Saturday night I had a dream. And this isn't a trick or a, story, or, or a fake story, I really did have a dream as I slept that Saturday night. This dream was so real to me and impressed upon my heart so much that when I got up to give my prepared Sunday school lesson, I stepped in front of the, a podium that we had to talk to the, a group of kids that we had, and right then the Lord said, don't go with your prepared Sunday school lesson. Tell them about this dream that you had. And that might seem a little hocus pocus or something, but I figured I'd follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the dream went like this. My dad and I were in a skyscraper. And we were in one of the top levels. Now, on this level, they didn't have walls with windows, but the entire walls were giant panes of glass. So we could look out over this large city, and we could see all the buildings and all the people like ants going around and little cars moving, and it was really impressive. Now, on this level was a real fancy restaurant, the kind where you sit at the table and they have the different forks that I don't know which one you're supposed to use, and all the different utensils and cups, and I'm not sure exactly how all that works. So I was a little nervous. But my dad's a businessman, and he said, they teach us how to deal with uh, people in situations like this, and I have to talk to millionaires about big business deals all the time, so just follow my lead. And I said, okay, I think I can go with that. 
So I looked around, and I just kind of took in the atmosphere. And they had a guy on the grand piano in a tuxedo playing nice music in the background. And they had a, a bar over in the corner, much like the one that we have up here at the top of the stairs. And they had people uh, uh, serving drinks and, and uh, people in their nice suits and dresses. And they were talking and mingling, and big business deals were going on. And life was going on as normal. They had a buffet set up. It was a real nice buffet, and I don't know why I remember this, but I can even remember the smells and the things that were on the buffet. About halfway down, they had one of those bowls of yellow pudding that they have at every buffet. You know what I'm talking about? They had a yellow pudding. And something that I thought was strange is at the beginning of the line, they had one of those silver ice cream machines. They had the vanilla on the left and the chocolate on the right, and what they have in the middle? The twist or the swirl, right? So um, I, I noticed that, and I thought, well, I guess if that's what these fancy people want, I guess they give them what they want. Well, we were looking, and the uh, piano music was playing in the background, and I looked over at the, build at the uh, skyline, and boom, a plane hit the building, and everything went black. I want you to go ahead and close your eyes with me. Go ahead and close your eyes. I won't, I won't scare you or anything. Everything had gone black. I could tell that I had fallen down. I could tell that I was still alive. I could tell there were ceiling tiles or something on me. Uh, just, I guess it was uh, rubble. And so I brushed that off of me, and I immediately started to look for my dad. So I was calling out for his name, and he said, I'm right here, I'm right here, don't worry. And there were lots of strange noises. It was obvious to me that the plane had hit the building and severed electrical wires or something so that it had gone out. But there still was not even any sunlight because of all the rubble that was around. It was dark as a thousand midnights. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Well, I found my dad, and we uh, reached each other, and we put our arms on each other's arms, and we stood up. We faced each other, and we put our hands on each other's shoulders, so we knew we were standing, and we knew we were uh, facing each other. And so I consider my dad to be a smart guy. When I was younger, I would ask him why the grass was green or why the sky was blue, and any question I asked him, he had an answer for. Now, he might have had to make it up, but he had an answer for any question that I asked him. And so, knowing what had happened on September 11th, and knowing the answer to my own question, I turned in his direction, seeing nothing like you do now, and I said, is this building going to fall? And at this time in my life, when there are difficult times like this, when everyone knows there are situations that are going to go bad, these are often times people will turn to their loved ones and give them a word of encouragement and say, don't worry, everything is going to turn out all right. And that's what I was expecting from my dad. I knew we didn't have time to climb downstairs, and I knew if we jumped out the window, it wouldn't end well. I knew we were trapped, and this was it. So I asked my dad, is this building going to fall? And he said, yes, son, it is. And I was suddenly without hope of surviving. And I said, the only thing that came to my mind, I said, well, I guess I'll see you in a few minutes. Now, that never would have come to my mind had I been conscious. But my dad is a Christian. He's accepted Christ's free gift of salvation for his sins. I myself am a Christian because I've accepted Christ's free gift of salvation for my sins. And so I knew that whatever time had passed, we would see each other in just a few moments. I had said I'll see you in a few minutes because I didn't know how long it would take for the building to fall, though it could be just seconds. And I also didn't know how it worked after we got there. I didn't know if we would die like five seconds apart and there'd be people from other parts of the world that had died and we'd be in this long line and so we'd be separated, and we might not see each other. I wasn't sure if we'd appear on opposite sides of heaven and have to find each other. So I said, I'll see you in a few minutes. I wasn't sure how exactly how that was going to go. Then I was immediately impressed with the overwhelming desire to witness to those around me. You can go ahead and open your eyes. Thank you for participating. The Lord brought up to my attention as I heard people screaming and moaning, and I heard people dying all around me. These people have only a few seconds left, those that are already left. They will spend eternity somewhere, and you are the only one who can reach them. So what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do about it? Now, I had sermons prepared for situations like this, and I do. Strange situations that might arise, and I call them my airplane sermons. Now, I am very confident that there are other people in this room that have airplane sermons, whether you know it or not. We say, what's an airplane sermon? When you go and sit down in an airplane, you know that the statistics say you have a better chance of dying in a car wreck on the way to the airport than you do in the flight that you are about to take. So you know it's all going to end up well, probably. But there's that, there's that slight doubt that something could go wrong. 
And so I try to bring my Bible so I have opportunity to read. Maybe if I open it up, somebody will ask me. I'll have an opportunity to witness and tell them about the hope that they can have in Christ. And so I knew I'd have that with me. And so whenever I get on a plane, I click my seatbelt and I start to look around and see all the people who are there. And if we're in the air, if we're in the air and we get notice that it's not going to end well, that the plane's going down, I know what I'm going to have to do. I'm sure someone else has thought of this. I'm going to have to take on, off my seatbelt. I'm going to have to stand on my chair, and I'm going to have to say, everyone listen up. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The, Roman, uh, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Wages are what we earn for what we've done, and what we've earned for our sin is death. The Bible says there are two deaths. One is physical and one is spiritual. The book of Revelation says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A gift is free. It can't be earned. A gift is free. It can't be paid for. God offers us the gift, the gift of eternal life through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. Well, how can you accept this gift of salvation for yourself? Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm not sure exactly how much time I'll have to work with, so I have a few different versions of my airplane sermon ready. So I'm going to have to, when they give us the bad news, I'm going to have to hit my little button and it goes ding and get the uh, stewardess's attention and say, when you say we're going down, is this like we've lost power in 50% of one engine and we're going down quickly or is this, we got struck by lightning and have no power and we're dropping like a rock? I mean, which one are we working with here? And so, now I know it's crazy. I've thought through these things. So I knew, I knew in my dream that that's what time it was. It was time for an airplane sermon. But I knew literally at any second that the floor was going to fall out from underneath my feet. So I had to give the shortest one that I had. And if I had time, then I would give another one. So I was trying to think of all the phrases that I could uh, to let somebody know how they could accept Christ as their Savior. All the ways I had ever heard it. I didn't even know which way I was facing because it was pitch black. So I cut my hands in the directions of the cries of the people. And I said, ask Christ to save you. Accept Christ as your Savior. Repent of your sins. Turn to God. Surrender your heart to Christ. Call on the name of the Lord for salvation. And when I had said everything that I knew to say, I started back at the beginning of the list. I said, ask Christ to save you. Accept Christ as your Savior. Repent of your sins. And the bottom fell out from under me. And I knew it was time for me to give an account of myself to God. I knew I had died. And so this is what I'm thinking. I, said, I know what's going to happen. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this a judgment. Each of us will stand before God to give an accounting of what we've done with what he's given us. He's going to say, I gave you life and I gave you my son. What did you do with it? And I knew what he was going to say to me. He was going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, for the last 15 seconds of your life. I'm thinking, that's what I had to offer God? 15 seconds of faithfulness right at the end? What a shame. I'd wasted it. I'd wasted my life. I'd gone to work. I'd paid my bills. I was a responsible citizen, but I hadn't done anything that mattered for eternity. I could have preached those sermons all along. I could have reached out to people, and I didn't. And, oh, I was filled with regret just wishing that I had another chance. And I could feel dust on my lips and dust on the hairs of my arms. And I saw this beam of light, and I could tell that there was something heavy on me, so I pushed it off, and it was rubble. And I realized I had survived the fall. I looked down, and there was a Bible in my hand, and God said, you've got it. You've got your second chance. Now get up. Get busy. There's a lot of work to do. Oh, I was so thankful I had another chance. Another chance to be found faithful. Before that dream, I never would have imagined my last words to somebody, to my dad in that instance, would be, I guess I'll see in a few minutes. I never considered if I was with another Christian, knowing that I was going to die, that we'd be separated only by a few minutes, maybe a few seconds. The Bible says to be absent from the body for Christians is to be present with the Lord. First words and last words are very important. I would like everyone to turn to Psalm 51. If you are able to bring your Bibles, turn to Psalm 51. That's where we will end up. Jesus' first words and last words dealt with the same subject, and that was repentance. We're going to see in Psalm 51 what repentance looks like. 
In Matthew 4, 17, we see Jesus' first words. Not his first words ever as a baby, but the first words of his earthly ministry. First sermon that Jesus preached went like this. Matthew 4, 17 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, in the Bible's original languages, the word repent means to turn back to God, to turn back from evil. It's the same word that's used to describe what the dove did after uh, Noah sent it out the first time, and it came back to him. It's used to describe what the angel of the Lord told Hagar to do. He told her to return back to Sarah. This is what Abraham told his servants he and his son would do when they were done sacrificing. I love this story. We're not going to look at it in depth. Abraham knows he's going to have to sacrifice his son. He brings his servants to help carry the wood and everything. They end up at the bottom of the mountain. He says, I am going to be obedient to God, but my son and I will both return. He believed God. He had great faith, and it was counted to him for righteousness. The word repent is translated in Matthew 4, 17 to mean to change one's mind for better, heartily to amend with abhorrence, with hatred of one's past sins. It's to be, to, uh, be sickened of one's sins and hate the sin that has been committed. There's definitely a need for repentance today in our lives, in the lives of Americans and people around the world. For those who, have not, who are not saved, we saw as in my airplane sermon, we are all unclean, that we are all sinners. Many people think that they're pretty good. I was speaking to a man, even I was witnessing to a man this, uh, about a week ago. He does good things. He holds important positions, so he thinks he's going to be okay with God. Many of us think that way. But I'm here today to tell you that I love you enough to tell you that that's not the criteria that God is using. The Bible says that we are all sinners. If you think you're a pretty good person, hold yourself up to God's law. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. Have you ever told a lie? If you have, you've violated God's law. The Bible says to violate at one point is to violate the whole thing because God's standard is perfection. Have you ever stolen anything regardless of value? If you have, you're a thief and you violated God's law. Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? That's called blasphemy. The Bible says that the Lord will not hold him guiltless who uses his name in vain. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, the right things, the best thing we can do are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities or our sins, like the wind, have taken us away. Lost person, your need today is salvation. But what about you, Christians? What about us? For those of us who have accepted Christ, repentance should be an ever-present attitude when we transgress our holy and righteous God. 1 John 1, 9 was written to Christians. And it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess means to agree. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. But it does. One thing I am very good at getting away with sin is rationalizing. Coming up with these false excuses to convince myself that it's okay to do what I want rather than what God wants. To confess is to agree. It's to finally agree with God. It's to say... You call this lie a sin. And although I might want to rationalize it and give good reasons why I have done it, I finally confess. I agree with you, God. It is sin, and I ask your forgiveness. Lost person, you are commanded by God to turn from your sin. It's what is good, and it's just the right thing to do. The Bible says in Acts 17, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. So what does repentance look like? I'm going to tell you a quick story about King David. We'll look at Psalms 51 and then we'll be done. Nathan the prophet, the man of God, comes to King David. He comes to King David and he said, I'd like to tell you a story. There is a very wealthy man. He had... When we, when we see wealth today, we say they have fancy cars and a big house and all these things. Well, in those days, they had lots of animals. So they said, this guy has lots of houses and he has lots of animals. And everyone at that time would have gone, ooh, this guy really was rich. So he said he had lots of animals and he had a neighbor. And this neighbor was a very poor man. He had only his family, his small family, and one little ewe lamb. And the Bible says, as I would put it, that this lamb was like the family dog. 
He said, they said it was sleep in his bed, and the kids would pet it, and they would feed it from the table even though they didn't have much food. But, oh, they loved it so much. I imagine when they had family portraits taken that they would have the lamb come and they'd have pictures. I've seen your family portraits and you have your dogs in your pictures, right? Well, that's what they would do. And so they loved this lamb. It's, the Bible says it was like a daughter to him. Well, the story goes on as the prophet Nathan tells King David. He says this rich man had a guest coming from out of town. And so he went to the poor man's house and he took that lamb, that one ewe lamb that he loved, he killed it, and he served it as dinner for his guest. And King David stood up out of his seat, and he was outraged, and he demanded justice for this wicked person and what he had done. And the prophet Nathan stood up, and he pointed in his face, and he said, you're the man. You're the man that I'm talking about. You're the rich man. He said, your neighbor, all he had was a beautiful wife. He was not rich, but he served God, and he served you faithfully. You committed adultery with his wife, and you had him killed. He said, God is going to judge you for the rest of your life, and it's going to be bad. Now, that man had some guts. I tell you what, you know, you know why he was able to do that to the king of the land? Because he feared God rather than man. I was talking to someone even this morning. They said, what's your sermon about? I said, repentance. They said, man, you're not wasting any time. I said, listen, I, I would rather not have it that way. I would rather do God is love and these sorts of things. But God had a different idea, so I decided to go with it. Now, Nathan was certainly a good example as I was studying to be willing to do what God would have me to do. Nathan was willing to do that because he feared God rather than man. Now, as he went to King David, King David had two responses he could have given. He could have been like, I believe it's the uh, Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. And he could have said, off with his head. Do you know who I am? I am the king. No one talks to me like that. Who even let you in here? He could have said that. But I praise God that he didn't. He set such a wonderful example. 2 Samuel 12, 13 says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Immediate repentance. David committed adultery and David committed murder. And you know what he's remembered as? He's remembered as a man after God's own heart. You say, how is that so? Because when he was confronted with his sin, he found a place of repentance. David then wrote Psalm 51. You want to know what repentance looks like? Do you want to know what repentance sounds like? As we read this next passage, I want you to envision a broken man. He's filled with regret that he has wronged a holy and righteous God that has done him good, only good, all the days of his life. This psalm was written after Nathan the prophet confronted him with his sin. I want to read verses 1 through 12. I usually don't like to read lengthy passages, but it is so beautiful, and it's something that we all need to relate to. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom." Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me, hear you, make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. David, at this point of true repentance, did not go back to the sins he had forsaken. That's what repentance is. It's turning from it. To repent is not only to turn back to God, but also to turn your back on sin, to flee from it, to avoid it to despise it, and to run in the opposite direction. In his book, I Surrender, Patrick Morley writes that the church's integrity problem is in the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin. It's a change in belief without a change in behavior. It is revival without reformation, without repentance. 
And as my wife and I seek to reach young people, they say with the group of young people that there are now, this is something that is very prevalent in their lives. The way they've been trained and brought up through media and the different technolo technological advances, the way their brains are programmed, they take God and they compartmentalize him. What does that mean? 70% of young people say that God is important. Well, many pastors and uh, youth pastors stand up and say, praise the Lord, we have a revival. But as you look further, you see that there is church and religion in God, and that is part of their life, and that's important for that part of their life. But that does not carry over and affect the other parts of their life. They can live as they wish throughout the week. God and God's word does not change their life. It's good for them as they do spiritual things. So should we hate them and point our finger at them? No, no one's taught them differently. That's the way they've been programmed. What young people need and what young people here at Skyline Baptist need is people who will love them enough to show them differently, who will model it in their lives and say, God is not just good for church. He also can change your life. Christians, have you lost the joy of your salvation? David prayed in this, uh, in this uh, psalm, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Wow. There's nothing more miserable than a Christian who's not right with God. And if you're there, you know it. You say, man, he is talking to me. The Holy Spirit knew what he wanted him to say. A Christian knows the peace. A Christian knows the forgiveness. They know the joy they can have with that close fellowship with God. And although when you sin, you still have a relationship with God, that closeness, that fellowship is broken because your sin stands between you and God. That's not what God wants. He loves you, but he patiently waits for you to return to him. And repentance is the road back to God. And David illustrates beautifully in this psalm what repentance looks like. In conclusion, Luke gives us Jesus' last words in Luke 24, 46 through 47. People say, I thought Jesus' last words was, it is finished. He came back and he met with his disciples before he went back to heaven again. Luke 24, 46 through 47 says, Jesus is instructing them what he wants them to do now that he's getting ready to leave. And that repentance... And remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He said to these men, just like he said to me in my dream, okay, get up, start preaching repentance. Let people know, love people enough to tell them that they are not right with me, but I've done everything to restore them by sending my son. Are you lost and without God today? It is no accident. Any, everyone that is here, it's no accident that you are here. Whether you had plans to be here or not, whatever changed at the last minute, those who are here are the ones that God had planned to be here. God has orchestrated life's of Brent's events to bring you here, to hear from him and his word, to bring about a response in your life. If you are lost, he's brought you here to tell you that he loves you. He loves you enough to tell you that he will judge your sin, but it's not going to be a surprise. He wants you to know that. He wants you to know he's done everything he can to bring you back, to, a, to bring you to a relationship with him. He sacrificed his one and only son. He's given his all for you. He wants you to please accept his free gift of salvation. For those of you who are Christians, is there sin in your life keeping you from that closeness, robbing the joy of your salvation that you once had? God wants you to take an opportunity today to do as it says in John, 1 John 1, 9, to confess that, to say, God, those things that have been excusing my life, I now call sin like you do. Please take them from me. Christians, do you have loved ones who, if you were to be in an airplane with them as it's going down, you would not have the opportunity to say, I'll see you in a few minutes, because they don't have that hope of eternal life? The person who will most effectively reach them is you. Sinners, I encourage you to fall helplessly this morning before the righteous God that seeks to save you through his Son. Repent. Turn from your sin and turn to God. And Christians, we even more so should be heartbroken when we consider our sins. Like David, God has given us more than we could ever ask for. And like David, we should repentantly fall to our knees. Repent, turn from your sin, and turn to God. We're going to have a quick word of prayer. We're going to come and have a song of invitation. That's your opportunity to come and do business with God. Don't wait. As I start to pray, don't wait for me to finish. Come down and pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to open your word and what a powerful passage you've given us in Psalm 51 to show us David committed terrible sins against you, but you love him, you forgive him, you call him a man after your own heart because he was willing to admit his sin, admit his need for a savior, willing to come back to you. 
I pray that each one of us would have the attitude of as sin comes in our life, as you bring it to our attention through the man of God and through your word, I pray that we will have this repentant attitude right now for whatever it is in each person's life that you want them to respond to you with. I pray that they would be obedient. I pray they would not live a life of regret. I pray that they won't wait for another chance. Right now, Lord, please move. Have your Holy Spirit convict us of sins, and I pray that each of us will respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come and pray. We thank you so much for being with us here at Skyline. I pray that you've been obedient to God, and if not, I pray that he'll give you another chance. Allow the Holy Spirit to continue to work on your heart. Be patient with God as he works on you. He will be patient with you as well. The invitation is never closed. God is always ready to receive you. I'm going to ask Brother Bill Jones to come and close us in prayer.